I want to talk about the Wagner group. Now, I'm not the first person to talk about the Wagner group. This isn't the first time I talked about the Wagner group, but I want to focus on one specific person, and that is the boss of the Wagner group, Yenigevi Prigozhin. Now, this guy is a character. He's filmed himself flying in the back of jets for propaganda reasons. He's fired himself next to artillery guns going off saying, oh, we're going we're gonna to take you Zelensky, yada, yada, yada. But he's also been extremely critical of the government, accusing them of intensifying uh, Wagner's shell hunger in order to undercut their attacks on Bakhmut because they were making the Russian military establishment uh, led by people like Shoigu, who is the Russian defense minister and close ally of Putin, by making them look bad. And so they're trying to undercut them by not just having the normal shell hunger that all Russian soldiers are facing right now, all Russian units are facing right now, but intensifying it for the Wagner group, which doesn't just negatively affect them, mind you, but it also negatively affects any of the other Russian units that are being flanked by the Wagner group and might need support by the Wagner group. And Yevgeny Prigozhin has not been quiet in responding to this, in fact, directly calling out the Russian military establishment, holding them as the culprit, saying that they have the blood on their hands. There's been videos and like really provocative videos where Wagner soldiers are like shooting cardboard cutouts, not really cardboard cutouts, but more like papers, pieces of paper with pictures on them of uh, Russian uh, military establishment figures. Uh, it's been a real war of words between Yegeny Prigozhin and the military establishment. Uh, but as the battle for Bakhmut rages on for 260 days, I did some calculation recently. I, I watched uh, letters from Iwo Jima uh, when I had some free time, and I was doing some research on the Battle of Iwo Jima, and I did the math. The battle for Bakhmut has been going on for eight and a half Iwo Jimas. Eight and a half Iwo Jimas. We're using Iwo Jima as a as a unit of measurement now. It's been going on for a while, but they've currently captured, I think, about 75 to 80 percent of Bakhmut, meaning there's still a lot for them left to capture. Uh, but every single building they capture, they lose soldiers, they lose troops, not only in the grind to take the building, but a lot of times uh, the Ukrainians will plant explosives so that when they leave, they'll just let it rip. Uh, reducing the building to rubble and killing many of the soldiers that take it. It's a really brutal tactic they're using. So the Wagner group is having a lot of trouble, even as they seemingly pick up some pace. Uh, if you want an idea of how much progress they've been making in recent days, before we read this uh, Yingeni Prigozhin article, uh, let's go to yada yada yada. Can we go to Bakhmut? Here we are. Uh, you can kind of see how over the last month, They've captured more and more of the city, and they're pushing them to the outskirts. There's still a decent amount for them to take. It's still going to be bloody for what's left for the Russians to take. But um, as the Ukrainian position in Bakhmut gets more and more tenuous, they do also need to remember that they're connected by this right here, the road of life, which the Russians are also constantly trying to threaten. So as much as they want to use Bakhmut as a meat grinder for the Russians for as long as possible to take as many Russians down as they can, delay their advance for as long as possible, and buy time for this coming counteroffensive, they also don't want to get encircled. Putting all of Bakhmut aside for a moment, we're not talking about Bakhmut today. I just went on a little tangent. What we're actually talking about is an article that Yengeni Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner Group, published that is absolutely bonkers. It, come, it almost feels like it comes from a doomsday cult that, that is predicting the end of days for Russia and how their, their loss in this war. And he, and he realistically talks about Russia losing this war, but how that loss of this war will lead to Russia collapsing and then rebuilding and rising from the ashes like a phoenix before then waging a final war against the West. Uh, it sounds very similar to uh, World War I Germany, to World War II Germany in the way he describes it. Um, and he also talks like, very realistically about the possibility of losing this war. And that's why um, if I was Yegeny Prigozhin right now, considering what he said here, I would stay away from a lot of tall buildings and I would not be booking any hotels considering how many Russian oligarchs have found themselves, you know, stumbling out of windows by accident. Let's read some of this article that, that, that breaks it down what Yegeny Prigozhin said. 
Wagner Group founder Yevgeny Prigozhin says that Russia has already accomplished its goals in Ukraine, but must keep fighting, even if it means humiliating defeat, so that the country can ultimately rise again as a quote-unquote war monster that the international community will bow down to. After recruiting thousands of prison inmates to help fight the war for Vladimir Putin and using his shadow army to emerge as a rival to Russia's top military brass, the mercenary boss and Kremlin-linked businessman offered his thoughts on the state of the war in a lengthy article published Friday. In addition to predicting that Russia will ultimately come back stronger than ever, Prigozhin appeared to admit that Ukraine may win its territories back, acknowledge that the Kremlin plan had failed, and predicted a full-blown revolution in Russia. For the authorities and for society as a whole, it is necessary today to put a decisive end to the special military operation, what they call the Russian invasion. The ideal scenario is to announce the end of the SMO to inform everyone that Russia has achieved the results that it planned, and in a sense, we have actually achieved them. We have ground down a huge number of fighters of the armed forces of Ukraine, and we can report that the tasks of the special military operation have been completed. Now, this is COPE, but it's also kind of smart what he's trying to get across here. If you're in Russian military brass right now, you need to see the writing on the wall that they have two options. One option is that they stay, and this is the best option, that they stalemate what they got, and though the war freezes, and over time they dig deeper and deeper trenches, more powerful uh, pillboxes, more powerful trenches that are going to be very difficult for the Ukrainians to break through, and then they negotiate a deal while occupying a decent chunk of Ukrainian territory, or they get pushed back by the Ukrainian counteroffensive that's coming in mid-spring, late spring to early summer, seems to be the current predictions as the counteroffensive date continues to shift as it's unpredictable. And if you see those as like the two likely outcomes at this point, then the idea of just hunkering down and saying, you know, we got what we got, it is what it is, and coping a little bit around what they have achieved compared to the original objectives, isn't that crazy? Now, to be clear, they have not achieved their uh, original objective. They haven't. The original objective was uh, the quote-unquote uh, demilitarization of Ukraine, which hasn't been achieved by any stretch of the imagination. Ukraine probably has more advanced technology than ever, even if a lot of the ammo storage and ammo, ammo reserves have been used up. Uh, they are using now a lot more advanced Western systems imported from the West, whether it be the high Mars systems that have torn up Russian uh, supplies that have been stored behind the front, or maybe we're talking about the Patriot air defense systems that are now being set up across the country to defend from Russian missile attacks. So demilitarization, that hasn't succeeded. Um, it also probably hasn't succeeded in what it would have originally meant by its denazification statement. Now, when we say denazification, to be clear, it's mostly a propaganda point. Nazism doesn't really have anything to do with this war. But if you wanted to interpret that into something that's actually like, you know, real, uh, the way I would interpret it uh, is as they wanted to replace the government in Kiev, that the quote-unquote Banderite government needed to go. That's something that they're not going to be able to achieve. Another goal that they set forward was stopping the expansion of NATO. Finland has joined NATO, more than doubling Russia's border with NATO by Finnish membership, and Sweden is probably next. So stopping NATO expansion that has not been that successful, not to mention NATO is more coordinated with Ukraine and is working with Ukraine more deeply than ever. Uh, quote unquote, saving the Russian speakers of Ukraine, which was one of the goals that they put forward at the start. Uh, even though I, I see that mostly as concern trolling, if we were to interpret that literally, I would point to the fact that in 2021, the year before the invasion, nine civilians died nine that's it now that's a tragedy that nine civilian died from mines and from shelling and stuff like that it's bad but comparing that 
to the death toll in 2022 and 2023 so far, when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of deaths, much of it still unreported and and uncovered due to the fact that we can't get independent investigators into Mariupol, and there's reports of evidence of, of atrocities and mass graves being covered up with bodies being dumped into the basements of buildings and then being covered over. No matter what your interpretation of the exact death toll, it's impossible to compare the nine deaths, 2021, to the hundreds of thousands of deaths that have happened since the February 24th invasion of Ukraine. So if we were to really gauge this war based upon Russia's original objectives, even if we were to throw in there uh, capturing all of the Donbass, which is something that is, has sometimes been tacked on. That hasn't been achieved either. Kramatorsk has still not been captured. Slovansk has still not been captured. Hell, Bakhmut has still not been captured. Uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of locations that they still need to capture to capture the rest of the Donbass. They have also not united uh, another uh, oblast that they annexed, the Kherson Oblast. In fact, they've been pushed out of the city of Kherson, the only regional capital to capture for the whole world. They're supposed to capture the rest of Zaporozhye, but the idea of the Russians actually capturing that city, and I've been there a few times now, is preposterous. And so the idea that they're going to be able to annex the rest of that oblast is silly. So putting, reeling all of that in, all, all I say that all to just get across the point that they have not really achieved the original objectives of the special military operation. The special military operation was only supposed to last a week. And now we're here over a, over a year later uh, in the mess that the Russians have created. Uh, anyway, let's continue. But, I understand, but, but to be clear, I understand why he wants to claim victory now is because he wants to cut his losses, which is the smart thing to do. He claimed that, in theory... Russia had already put a decisive end to the war by wiping out a huge chunk of Ukraine's male population. It's quite silly. It still has a lot of men left to keep fighting. Still a decent percentage of the diaspora that that comes back. Um, Russia also suffered a huge blow to its male population, not only through just military casualties, but you know, Russian workers who have fled the country either to get away from military conscription or to deal with the fact that their jobs have left and there's a deteriorating uh, situation when it comes to the Russian economy. So, like, you guys have less men and Ukraine has less men. Like, I don't know that if that's really a net game for Russia. Uh, and they sent refugees fleeing and seized territory. By the way... Him saying that Russia's already put a decisive end to the war, and then the three big victories is they killed a lot of Ukraine's male population. That's not a good thing to say that was your objective, is it? Just, I want to make it so it's impossible for Ukraine to resist. That's not, that doesn't sound very cool. Sending refugees fleeing, that being objective of war, is just evil. And seizing territory. And that's more of the classical muahaha Disney Disney level villain evil of, yeah, we're going to conquer and annex territory. But openly stating that part of your objective is to reduce the population of the nation you're invading, supposedly deliberated, and to send refugees fleeing is pretty darn evil. A minute, of course, was that the same could be said about Russia on the first two points. And bizarrely, amidst all of his pontificating, Prigozhin appeared to admit that Ukrainian territories seized by Russia aren't actually with Moscow forever, as the Kremlin has often claimed. Ukraine stands to lose if the war comes to a standstill, he said, because those territories that are today under the control of the Russian Federation can stay at the disposal of the Russian Federation for years. Lest anyone think he's suggesting Russia should call it quits, however, Rogozin went on to cheer on a planned Ukrainian counteroffensive, saying, the sooner it starts, the better. But he admitted the result could prove catastrophic to Russia, saying, it's not very likely Moscow could launch a colossal counteroffensive of its own and take territory deeper into Ukraine. He also acknowledged that many of those who initially supported the war are now doubtful or categorically opposed to what's happening, and and confessed that Russia could not achieve the results that society expected, man. This is a lot. 
This is basically Prigozhin saying that they've gotten what they've gotten. They're not going to capture or liberate anything else. There's no big Russian counteroffensive coming, most likely. And the best they can do is hold on to what they've gotten. Oh, and that there's less and less support for the war in Russian society. If Ukraine's counteroffensive manages to break through Russian defenses, he said, an army that for years considered itself one of the best in the world would be thoroughly demoralized. The thing is, this has already happened. Like, twice. This happened during the Kharkiv counteroffensive, and that happened more shockingly because it really just felt like the front line of the Russians collapsed, which it did. In fact, if the Ukrainians had more troops in the area to fill up that hole, they probably could have capitalized on the Kharkiv breakthrough even more, going even further than recapturing Kupyansk. And then, of course, there was the Kherson counteroffensive, and there was also the Kiev counteroffensive and pushing out the Russians from Kiev. There's been a lot of counteroffensives, but, but I would say that another one, one that would cut to uh, the Sia of Azov, that would cut into Mariupol, that would free Metiopol, which would be a, a logistical center for the Russians, one that would cut deep into Russian-occupied territory, uh, cut deep, cut in half the Russian occupation, that would be a massive blow to the morale of the army. And it would. And I, th I do think there would be a lot of questions about how much longer they could even sustain any defense whatsoever. Uh, in that case, he said, global changes in Russian society could lead to an all-out revolution as pro-war patriots seek revenge against bureaucrats and figures who are either critical of the war or reluctant to use harsh old battlefield methods. Again, man... World War I to World War II Germany vibes, man. You hear it right now. It was those behind us who backstabbed us, that foiled us from behind. It wasn't that it was a foolish war. It was that we were betrayed. His solution, strangely, is for Russia to let itself sink to rock bottom by doubling down even further, despite its myriad losses over the past year. According to him, that's America's worst nightmare. Because if Russia gets to the bottom, then it will push off from there and float up like a huge sea monster, demolishing everything in its path, including the United States. He appeared to shrug off further losses and even a battering of the Russian military, saying that Russia would simply lick its wounds if it defeated in a Ukrainian counteroffensive. Russia cannot accept any agreement, only a fair fight. And if we come out of this battle battered, there is nothing to worry about. This is such cope. To be clear, he's saying that America, America's worst nightmare is if Russia collapses. America's worst nightmare is if the Russian government fails in Ukraine, is forced out of the country, and that their military is battered and hollowed out. That is its worst nightmare because then... Russia is going to go on like an anime training arc, a revenge arc. It's going to like, I don't know, join the ninjutsu school, school Naruto, One Piece, Cowboy Beep Up. It's going to go on like some, you know, like uh, what is it, like Juju Hakusho or like any, any of these shows. I forget the name of uh, the Hakusho show. Any of these anime arcs. And by the end of it, they're going to be so powerful that... You're going to be able to get revenge against the United States. This is comical. This he's writing, he's writing a comic book, not political theory here. Yeah, you, you, Hakusho. I called it Juju Hakusho. No, you, you, Hakusho. Juju Hakusho. <laughs> oh, gosh. Either way, this is delusional. The United States would probably be, from a geostrategic level, very willing to accept Russia going under militarily being very willing to accept Russia withdrawing from Ukraine. And uh, by the time Russia had licked its wounds to invade Ukraine again, uh, if America played its cards right, uh, there's a decent chance by, by the time they would be ready to, Ukraine would be in, even, in, in an even better position as they would be more integrated with the West when it comes to training, ammunition stockpiles, the type of weapons that they're using, the more updated modern equipment, and possibly even NATO and EU membership. And if that's the case, then there's nothing Russia can do because there's no level Russia can get to where it can fight a war with all of NATO in, in an effort to try to conquest old territory.
What a bizarre article, man. What a bizarre article from Fergozin. It seems like he's willing to accept that Russia's bit off more than it could chew. And he's basically trying to deliver in the best way possible and in the, in the softest way possible. Like, okay, boys, let's hold on as tight as we can. This is going to be a rocky road. But putting all that somewhat, what almost seems like a little bit of reasonableness aside, it eventually devolves into doomsday prophet, like doomsday prophecy that Russia will collapse and we will go into civil war. But by the end of it, we will come up like the Phoenix and no one will be able to stop the return of the third Rome. It's, it's delusional. At Dylan Burns TV from Cheese Crow, I've been listening a lot to Fine and Pitonsky. Sounds like they're getting ready to replace Putin. That's why people like Prigozhin and Streklov Gherkin openly criticize the government. Honestly, man, I've heard a lot of people talking about, you know, they're getting ready to replace Putin. They're getting ready to replace Putin. I don't think it's happening in the near future. I think there's probably whispers about like, yeah, I wish our profits were good well, like they used to be. I wish we were able to access Western markets. You know, I don't like how the cost of living has gone up. You know, yeah, we don't like how we're wasting all this money on the war. We don't like how the war is being managed. They probably have a million complaints. But challenging Putin is much more likely to get you killed than Putin deposed. And if you try to depose Putin, it isn't like, ah, uh, okay, you, uh, you got me, you caught me. Oof, I won't do it again. You're dead. You're dead if you try to overthrow Putin and you fail. So taking that into consideration, I don't think there is um, enough support for, for kicking him out yet. 